All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going, team? Here, and this is BXJS Weekly JavaScript News Podcast, episode thirty-seven. And uh, yeah, we got a whole ton of really cool things today. Hello, Bako. Welcome to the stream. Hey, Memphis. Welcome as well. Um, let's get started because I don't want to drag this out for too long. We do have quite a bunch of very interesting articles and topics to talk about. And 2 million different demos and libraries and uh, things that I want to basically show off. So let's get cracking. First article we got today is this, uh, the absolute easiest way to debug uh, Node.js with VS Code. This is essentially a tutorial that guides you through the debugging. Uh, well, first of all, it walks you through what are the possibilities of debugging Node.js and what is the easiest one According to the author, which is the debugging with VS Code, which is actually really, really good. Uh, if you never tried it, do give it a shot. It's very easy to set up, and this article will tell you exactly how. And the debugging process is very similar to what you would do in just about any other IDE, to be honest, with the other programming languages. And you have like breakpoints, a call stack, a watch, and whatever you can imagine. Basically, it's all right here, all in VS Code works amazingly well, to be honest. So uh, if you ever wanted to try that, but never did, then do have a look and try it out. It is really good, basically. All right, next article we got is called an annotated webpack for config for frontend web development. And this is essentially a walkthrough through the setup of webpack for from the scratch for the frontend development with Vue.js. So if you already know how the webpack works, if you already know all the needs, you know, bits and pieces, and you know how the webpack config works, you won't really find anything new here. But if the webpack is the black box for you, and you wanted to learn, you know, about all the bits and pieces that it has about webpack dev server, Code module replacement, code splitting, lazy loading, and writing your own Webpack configs. Then this article does a very great job of walking you through at least the Vue.js uh, project setup with post CSS and stuff like this. Has a bunch of different uh, Webpack configs, including you know like one for development, one for production, one for legacy stuff, one for modern stuff. It is very interesting, and uh, once again, you know, if you already know everything about Webpack, then uh, it's not going to be anything new here. How is Parcel keeping up with Webpack? Um, Parcel has some downsides still. So the current version is losing to Webpack, for example, in terms of uh, you cannot really build libraries with uh, Parcel, right? It's going to include all the packages anyway, and at least I couldn't find a proper way of doing it. It was a bit annoying. But uh, apparently there's a new version of Parcel coming and we're going to see how that compares to Webpack because I mean, Webpack has a head start, right? Quite, quite a large one. So, um, but yeah, coming back to the article. So if you want to learn about the Webpack configs, about the basic project structure with Webpack, um, it is very lengthy and it explains just about every bit that you would want to know in a very large, like, you know, in a very detailed way, essentially. So um, do check it out. Next article we got is called Lazy Loading Components in React 16.6 uh, Code Splitting and Lazy Loading React Components with a Suspense and React.lazy. So, this is essentially um, a bit in depth tutorial, I guess, on the new features that were added to React 16.6, specifically Suspense and Lazy Loading, how you can do code splitting, dynamic imports, and how you can do stuff like dynamic root loading uh, with a new React. So you already know all about that, which you know, it's not extremely complicated topic, you won't really find anything new here. But if you wanted to learn about how all of that stuff works, and if you were confused about it, then this article does a very good job of explaining just about everything you want to know uh, before getting started with all of that. So and there's even a basic example with a calendar app right here. So if you're curious and wanted to learn about that, do check it out. It is quite cool. All right. Next article we got here is, uh, yeah, this one is really, really cool. The how and why on React's usage of linked lists in fiber to walk the components tree. This is, um, I believe it was one of the uh, uh, articles. Uh, yes, exactly. This post opens a series on React fibers internal. So this is going to be a series of posts from the author talking about the internals of React fiber, which is the React new React uh, rendering engine, essentially, right? So if you ever wondered how does React Fiber works and how React works internally, 
then this article gives you a really cool look at least into the um through uh blah, let me try that again at least into the component tree in fiber and how does the fiber actually walks it it's a very niche very specific topic and you know i guess if you don't really have any interest in knowing the internals of react this article won't be very interesting to you but if you're curious as to how the react works internally how does the vdom represent it how does the fiber works with it how does the render function goes about you know traversing the whole uh, jsx tree that you construct and all that kind of stuff it's really interesting like there is some pretty cool things that i did not know about react but you know then again i never actually uh, tried looking into the react so in depth but it was a pretty enlightening experience so if you are if you have even slightly if you have even slightest interest i quite highly recommend looking at this article there is some very interesting things to be found all right, next article we got here is code splitting and server-side rendering for Preact async routes. This article specifically talks about the Preact, not React, because Preact, while, you know, is very similar to React, it does have some unique things that uh, set it aside, essentially, right? So this article specifically talks about Preact and Preact router and how you go about setting up server-side rendering code splitting and uh, increasing time to interactivity and how you actually measure all of that using the dev tools. Um, so if you are curious about Preact and if you ever wanted to make your app faster, smaller and um, yeah, delve into essentially homegrown server-side rendering, then do check this out. It's a really good uh, starter essentially. All right. Next article we got here is from the WebKit team. It's called Web High Level Shading Language. And it talks about the new shading language that is going to be called Web High Level uh, Shading Language. That is exactly the name of it. Uh, V-H-L-S-L or pronounced VISL as they say there. And it's apparently a new language that is now being worked inside of W3C, I believe. They were mentioned one of the working groups that was working on it. But uh, yes, it is worked by the WebGPU community group at W3C, which is really awesome, which means it's gonna be like a new proper standard. And uh, we're gonna get a WebGL based or WebGPU based uh, shading format, which is kind of interesting how all of that is gonna end up and um, what, what would it mean essentially for fancy 3D graphics on the web. But uh, yeah, this, uh, the article itself walks you through just about everything you wanna know about that language, including everything that the language includes essentially with samples and stuff. It's very big as you can see. So if you have even slightest interest in web graphics, then I guess this is the article to read essentially and the technology to keep an eye on. So once again, you know, the working group just started work on it. So it's not um, probably not even close to being final, but it's interesting nonetheless seeing this kind of stuff being in development, you know? All right. Next article we got here is from the V8 team. It's called Faster Async Functions and Promises. And it talks about how the V8 team made the async await faster. So if you write, you know, idiomatic async await code and promises and stuff like this, your code will be getting faster and faster and faster with pretty much every iteration. There's also some crazy comparison um, on the, you know, running the docs B benchmark. Um, in uh, different versions of Node.js, this jump from Node 7 to Node 10 is absolutely insane. And um, as you can see here, the usage of promises and native async await is now uh, actually beating the Babel transpiled async await, um, like polyfilling thing. So yeah, write idiomatic code and you will never lose essentially is what this uh, tells you. And uh, they also have some benchmarks uh, using the real world HTTP middleware frameworks with the same code. And uh, yeah, as you can see here, the gains in speed is also quite crazy. Node 7 had about 10,000 requests per second with Happy, and now it's near like 28,000 requests per second with Node 10, which is just insane when you think about it. It's like nearly three times improvement, like just by switching the engine, you know, which is kind of crazy. And Node 10 is, by the way, running on V868, which does include all the latest optimizations that come like in uh, V870 and 71 that is coming out quite soon. 
So yeah, there is obviously, you know, since this is a V8 devlog, there is a lot of uh, details on how exactly they achieved it. The more in-depth look into what the tasks and micro tasks are in the engine, how exactly that works. So like, you know, you have the set immediate set timeout tasks in event loop, and then there's a micro task queue, which handles await and promises. So it was quite an interesting read to see how exactly it works under the hood and what exactly was done to make it faster. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. There is a tons of information here and all of that is absolutely fascinating and very interesting. But then again, you know, it's very low level. So if you have no interest in, in sort of low level engine level things, uh, although I think, you know, if you have any serious intentions of working with JavaScript long term, you should learn at least a bit of that, or at least just read it and try to understand because there is some very valuable info on how to make your app faster actually in here. All right, next article we got here is the React for the Angular developer. And this is a look from the perspective of a long-term Angular developer at the React.js and uh, how does it compare to Angular? So he was writing Angular apps for a long time and then tried switching to React using the React stack, including, you know, React Router, transition groups, form libraries, GraphQL testing and stuff like this. And then he shares his opinion on how he liked it or not and uh, what kind of the uh, paradigm changes he had to like shift in his head to actually better understand React and to change to it from Angular. And also interesting things like, you know, what did he actually miss in React and what he did not miss in comparison to Angular. So if you are writing a lot of Angular and want, you know, always wanted to get into React JS, but was kind of confused about it, or maybe didn't know if you should do the leap, do check this article out. It gives a pretty interesting perspective. Maybe it will help you. Okay. Next thing we got here is after two years with TypeScript, was it worth it? Uh, another sort of retrospective from the uh, team that wrote, used TypeScript for two years, as the title says, and there's basically insight and was it worth it? Would they do it again? Would they like it? And you know, how, what kind of problems did they encounter? What kind of things did they have to cope with? Like workarounds and stuff like this. So if you consider working with TypeScript or maybe you're already working and uh, want to watch out for the sort of edge cases, learning curve and stuff like this, do check this article out. I mean, it's mostly non-technical. It's mostly like, you know, it's typical the right respectives happen to be is mostly sort of um, conceptual level, right? But it is nonetheless quite interesting. All right. Next article we got here is, oh yeah, this one is really cool. Why Facebook's API starts with a for loop. A very curious look at the um, return, the JSON that is returned from the Facebook API. Right, and why does exactly it start with a for loop? And essentially this is a deep dive into JSON hijacking technique that is a type of the CSRF attack or subtype, I guess, of CSRF attack that allows the attacker to uh, fetch the API using your browser, like sending you, for example, an email that would actually just uh, trigger the loading of an API through embedded link and then parse that API through the hijacking of the object getter and then send this hijack data somewhere. So essentially redefining this uh, define getter thing allows you to um, do pretty crazy things, to be honest, like, yeah, like the, the there's code and deep dive into all of that stuff. I just, you know, the thing is that this is a subtype of the CSRF, um, um, CSRF attack, right? And if you just use CSRF tokens, it essentially negates it. But apparently, I guess, not all of the, like, I'm not sure why they opted for still having a for loop there, even though you could theoretically just go with CSRF tokens, right? I guess there are some legacy clients or legacy code base inside of Facebook that actually um, does not allow them to just use CSRF tokens. But um, yeah, it's just, anyway, it's absolutely fascinating read. So if you have any even bare interest in, security, then do check this out. It is really, really cool. And this, the write up itself is pretty detailed and explains how exactly the attack works and how exactly does this for loop in the beginning protects you from this kind of attack. So it's uh, kind of cool. Yeah. All right. Next article we got here is handling errors in JavaScript, the definitive guides. 
exactly as the title says, it is everything you want to know about handling JavaScript errors and you know, starting from the typical error objects, going through throwing and handling errors, going through the asynchronous code, going through the callbacks and custom errors and uh, generating and handling errors specifically on the server and then rendering errors in your front end app, how you go about that. So I, it's basically all you want to know about that, right? So maybe there is not that many like super specific edge cases that you would encounter that sometimes happens. But if you were confused about some parts of, you know, working with errors in JavaScript, then this article will be a very good guide that will tell you, but I would say 90% of what you actually want to know about the errors, right? So if you were interested, do check it out. Okay, next article we got here is React Hooks in Action, building a to-do app with no classes, obviously. Uh, if you thought that React Hooks is no longer going to appear in this podcast, then well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it looks like we're going to be having React Hooks on this podcast for next year, maybe, <laughs> probably even more. What am, like, what am I even talking about? React Hooks are awesome, and obviously people are using them a lot, so there's going to be a lot of content related to them. All right, so this article talks about building a to-do app in React, which is, you know, a straightforward thing that you would typically do to check out the new technology. But in this case, without using any classes, but using React hooks, which, well, I mean, for to do app, it actually works pretty straightforward. So if you are still confused about the React hooks, if you are still thinking, you know, how it exactly does it work, how do I use them in a the larger application, then do check this article out. It will actually guide you through the whole process and will teach you on how to set the whole uh, thing with the hooks without using uh, classes and, uh, you know, like object oriented react, let's put it this way. If you already know how the hook works is if you already know um, how to use hooks, then you won't really find anything new here. There's it's pretty basic. So it's a entry level, I would say into the react and hooks, but still nonetheless, pretty good uh, in depth write up for the whole to do app using hooks. All right. Next article we got here is build a simple in memory cache in Node.js. Well, it does exactly what it says talks about in-memory caching of the, in this case, specifically the HTTP requests by uh, not just using, you know, the stupidest way of in-memory caching is obviously throwing it into the object with a key and then you got the value, right? So in this case, the key would be URI and the value would be the result. But this doesn't really scale, right? Because you do want to update the data from time to time. So here the author talks about the API that specifically says that, hey, here's actually the expiration date for the data. So you can actually create a very simple in memory cache that would have expiration, right? So you can construct this data cache and then get the data from it. Or if data is invalidated, you could re request another set. So if you ever wonder how exactly to do that, then this tutorial will guide you through just about everything you want to know. If you already know that, then well, there's nothing uh, really unique or you know uh, amazing about that let's put it this way but it's a solid article nonetheless all right next article we got here is evan you previews vue.js 3.0 a write-up by uh, greg pollock and uh, adam yar um, about the view 3 presentation keynote i think it was given in view toronto that basically summarizes the talk from Evan Yu, who is the creator of Yu, about what is going to be happening in Vue 3 and what can you expect there. Um, essentially, it's faster, smaller, more maintainable code, more native friendly and easier to use, which, you know, for Vue is kind of a very, uh, considering how simple Vue is right now, it's kind of a crazy to set goals like this. Uh, one interesting thing that I personally found there is that um, they're going to be using proxy based observation instead of what they do right now. So basically, that means uh, it's not gonna Oh no, they actually plan to support IE 11, which is Oh, they're gonna basically Okay, so they're gonna I was confused because I watched the uh, the keynote itself. And he was talking about the using proxies. And uh, proxies are not available in Internet Explorer 11, right? So they're going to be shipping the build that has the old observation mechanism, which will work in IE 11. And then there's going to be the new build, which will double the speed and use half the memory, which is kind of insane and will use proxies. So it's kind of cool. I would be very curious to see how the view will look. Obviously, there will be hooks, of course, because hooks are the new hot thing. And um, there's going to be experimental hook support. So yeah, 
let's see how that turns out. But uh, Vue.js is a really nice framework and it's really cool to see uh, it going forward essentially. All right, next article we got here is from the Mozilla Hacks uh, guys and it's called The Power of Web Components. And it essentially is a tutorial of web components because they have been shipped in Firefox 63, right? So this is a guide on how to write your own web components from the scratch using, uh, you know, custom elements, templates, and everything that is related to them, including explainer on Shadow DOM and stuff like this. So if you wanted to get into writing your own web components, do check this article out. It has everything you want to get started. If you already know how the web components work and how to write them, then you won't really find anything new in here. Next article we got here is uh, element coverage for end-to-end -end tests by Gleb Bahmutov, uh, who is working on the Cypress end-to-end -end testing tool right now, right? And um, he was talking about, you know, looking at the end-to-end -end testing, you cannot really uh, use um, line like test coverage as the metric, right? Because Test coverage, like line, line coverage doesn't really mean anything in end-to-end -end testing because you, you won't cover all the lines, right? It is end-to-end -end testing, not unit testing. So he was, he came up with this idea of element coverage, which actually tells you how many UI elements your tests cover, which is a way more interesting and it probably would end up a way more impactful and meaningful metric uh, for the end-to-end -end testing. So if you're interested in end-to-end -end testing and if you're interested in alternatives to, you know, line coverage, uh, do check it out. It is very interesting and it seems to be, uh, you know, coming to Cypress, which again, the tool I probably should try at some point because it looks fantastic. But I just never sort of get my hands on it. But uh, maybe we should do it in one of the coding live streams. But yes, nonetheless, very interesting idea and a pretty cool writer. Okay, next article we got here is uh, creating iOS 12 shortcuts with JavaScript and shortcuts JS. Uh, so I guess for you folks who use uh, iOS out there, you should probably know the shortcuts thing. I'm not even sure what the hell is that. Uh, so the article talks about creating those shortcuts using JavaScript, which actually looks very slick. So this, you know, stuff like, I guess those things are shortcuts and maybe you can create them in the drawer thingy. I am not exactly sure, but you know, if you're using iOS and you know what the shortcuts are and you know how they work and you wanted to build your own using JavaScript, well, now there's shortcuts JS. And this is essentially, uh, first of all, a tutorial. And second of all, the write up on how exactly author made it so that you can write them in JavaScript, which is kind of neat. So if you're using iOS, do check it out. Seems to be pretty cool. Okay, next article we got here is building a screen recorder for the web with Cloudinary in a Jiffy. Essentially, um, introduction to the new web API, which is currently experimental. So um, you will have to go to the Chrome flags and enable experimental web platform features, which will actually allow you to capture the desktop using the uh, navigator get display media API, which I did not know before about, which is really awesome. Uh, you could just, you know, use this API to capture the desktop and either send it as a video or share it in real time. And uh, the fact that this API exists is really awesome. So um, yeah, if you if you were looking for doing something like this and recording a screen and or doing a screen share or, you know, something similar with native web technologies, then this essentially this tutorial walks you through doing exactly that. It is kind of, kind of great. I'm, I'm you know, there is more and more features coming to web platform and this is absolutely amazing. All right, uh, next article we got here is why React hooks and how did we even get here? Um, if you have seen uh, Dan Abramov's talk on React hooks where he introduced them and when he actually talked about how did they get there and why the hooks are important, this article basically does the same, right? So just in the written form and um, talking about more or less the same things, you know, like, hey, okay, so we have React, we had mix-ins first, they didn't quite work out because they had their share of problems. We switched to higher order components that are kind of nice and a very uh, universal pattern, but they also have their own problem. Then we switched to render props and children as a function, which is also very cool, but has its own share of problems. And finally, we got to the hooks that kind of solve all of those problems, but have their own shortcomings, right? So this is more or less the summary of Dan's talk and this article but in way more details than I just, <laughs> just talked about, of course. 
So if you were curious, how exactly did we got to the React hooks and uh, why are there, uh, what kind of problems are they solving, then do they check this article out. If you already know the, all about that, then well, you won't really find anything here. Also want to note that author says that he has over a thousand hours in Dark Souls and this is kind of terrifying, but uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, um, next article we got here is Node.js everywhere with environmental variables. An introduction to using environmental variables in your Node.js application to make them essentially customizable and runnable from different environments, which is a very handy thing to do. So if you never use them or was confused about how to do that, do check this article out. It walks you through the basic usage using the prefixed and variables, you know, before you run it, uh, then go into more complex setups with the .env files and using packages like .env to actually automatically parse them and access them in your app. Environmental variables are incredibly handy and can help you in a lot of cases, especially if you package and deploy your apps in Docker and you know need to have different setups for testing and uh, production, for example they can be very life-saving essentially. So if you were confused about them, do check it out. Uh, even if you if, even if you use them daily and you think you know everything, do check them out. Maybe you'll find a couple of packages that are mentioned here to be very interesting. At least I did. All right, next article we got here is building Amazon, blah, building Amazon Alexa skills with Node.js revisited. An updated version of article on how to build Amazon Alexa skill using Node.js and Amazon Web Services. Um, it seems to be actually very straightforward, especially with the newer versions of the SDKs. There's literally like a few hundred lines of codes at most. And you know, most of those are actually tests and this setup, which is kind of great when you think about it. So if you ever wanted to create your own Amazon Alexa skill, then now you can actually do that in just a few lines of code with this tutorial. So do check it out. Right, last article we got here today is called Cloud Computing Without Containers. And uh, it's only relatively related to JavaScript, I would say. So this is actually from the guys at Cloudflare who tend to do crazy experiments. And uh, this is one of the crazy experiments that they are doing, right? So they are talking about uh, the workers that they introduced, right? And the way that the workers actually work. So typically you have like a bunch of VMs, for example, that uh, live in the same machine and they, you know, give you this process overhead. And uh, there's a, this is, I, I think it's kind of a bit unfair because they only give this pattern, but not do not show you the pattern of uh, something like Docker or containers, you know, like C containers, uh, which is gonna be still gonna have pretty huge overhead, but it's gonna be smaller than virtual machines. And I guess it's gonna be in the middle between the virtual machines and isolates model. So uh, what they actually did is they took the V8 engine, right? Which is the JavaScript engine used in Chrome and they repurposed it for running the um, code as if it was a virtual machine because you know, the isolates in V8 is what runs your code that is isolated from each and every browser tab, right? Or each and every server actually, each and every website. And uh, what they did is that they actually took the code that the people want to deploy they compile it to WebAssembly and run it in isolates, which means that um, it, like they have some incredible numbers over here, even for the CPU intensive workloads, which is crazy, including the cold start problem, which you know, like if you run it in Lambda or Google Cloud or whatever, you always have this problem with the cloud, uh, cold start, right? Because the function needs some time to speed up and this is what you have to optimize for, right? So this is the typical issue with the function as a service architectures. When you write a function, it takes too long to start and then you have problems because you got built too much. And with the isolates architecture, that's not actually a problem because you don't really have uh, any start. You just have the context switching, right? And um, yeah, it's kind of insane approach Obviously they had to patch it for security. And if all of the topic sounds interesting, I would suggest that you look up at the, uh, they had a really in-depth, like pretty large discussion of this article on Hacker News. So um, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, it's really interesting, but 
I'm very curious to see, you know, if they're kind of open source it or if, if it's going to be um, completely closed and proprietary because I would want to deep dive into the code and see how exactly it works. Maybe I should just do something like this myself because the idea of using isolates for code execution seems absolutely fascinating. Um, I have a Cloudflare real IP problem, Docker Nginx only for IPv6. Um, feel free to join our Discord server and poke me there after the stream. I will be more than happy to try to help you with it. I don't really have any experience with the Cloudflare uh, like protection that they provide or the caching, but uh, we can still try to solve it anyway. Okay, this is it for the articles. Uh, so let us go into the short uh, things that I've gathered that are still pretty cool. The first one being peeking under the hood of redesign Gmail. Um, this is uh, this is very silly. So the Gmail does a new interface right now, right? And it's a Google product and the Google guys own V8 thing and they own Chrome and they own a bunch of other services that wants to make web faster and better. And then they have Gmail on the other hand. So the author here decided to throw um, Gmail into Lighthouse and other Chrome developer tools, um, utilities and see how it will fare. Well, this is the results from the lighthouse and it got a score of whooping two out of hundred. So it's basically abysmal and it is insane that this is the thing. And uh, yeah, it's, it's not the f like, it's not even the worst thing about it. So there's stuff like, you know, first meaningful paint happens at 8.22 seconds, which, which is just terrible. And then he looked at the, um, I'm not even gonna talk about the profiling. Um, he looked at the code's um, coverage, for example, right? And it seems like about 70% of the code, if not more, is just plain out not used by default, right? So unless you do some other things, there's a lot of code that just sits there in gmail.com and does nothing. And that is like a few megabytes of code essentially, which is freaking insane. And then the author actually went ahead and uh, looked into the code that was there to find that there is code from like, um, where was the list? Wait a second. Yes, there was like a leftovers of Google Picasa, which is not even a service anymore, or screen keyboard, which I guess 90% of users don't even use, or Google Calendar code, which is again, you know, you might never actually use in there. And it all is loaded at the same time. And this is why your Gmail is slow. It is insane that this is a thing, but um, yeah, this is apparently a thing. And uh, if you're curious about more technical details, do check this article out. It is not very large, but um, on one hand, it's really amusing. On the other hand, it is kind of painful to see stuff like this coming from Google. All right, next thing we got here is the animation with custom hooks shipped in React Simple Animate. Uh, so you can try the beta version now and it looks absolutely sick. You can now create animations uh, using either use animate or use keyframes uh, hooks. And it's just great. Like the style of doing this is just amazing. Um, is there a site that managed to get 100 score in Lighthouse? Yes, a lot of websites do get 100 score in Lighthouse. It's not actually that hard. Um, I Actually, so there's the Gmail classic CSS. Like the thing is the Gmail classic will only revert the look. The problem is this wants revert loading seven megabytes of garbage that like, you know, three or four megabytes of which is not used. This won't help the slowdown, right? So it's like, yeah, you can actually make it look old, but it won't make it faster. So it's like, yeah, I, I actually like the new looks of Gmail. I think the new looks are pretty neat, but the slowness of it is just abysmal. Uh, yes, Preact web app uh, has a very good default. So it's kind of, um, I think it gets like 98 or something by default or something without even tweaking anything. Next.js gets more than 90 by default. So it's not that hard. Okay, next uh, thing here is a tweet. Um, actually started from this tweet that said, hey, 25 years ago today, the first major web browser was released, Mosaic version 1.0. So this is, I don't think I've even used Mosaic at the time because I think I was too small at the time. Yeah, I don't think I've, was I even born at that time? I think, yes, I was already born, but I was like five years or something, six years old. 
Um, but yes, 25 years ago, basically, we got our first internet. And um, here's a little comparison uh, with the other technology and the speed of development. 25 years after the first light bulb, 99% still didn't have electricity. 25 years after the film, 100% of feature films were silent. 25 years after the TV was invented, 100% of black broadcasts were black and white. 25 years ago, internet appeared. Look at where the where we are now. This is insane speed and it is kind of awesome. So this is basically all I want to say. <laughs> all right, uh, apparently Twitter blocked me for opening too many links. Oh yeah, this is slide from uh, Google, uh, Chrome Dev Summit. Apparently Googlebot still uses Chrome 41 to crawl the web and uh, a lot of ES6 features are not recognized by crawlers. So if you care about SEO, you should support Chrome 41, which is again, pretty weird on Google's site. And there's like some Googlers in the comments saying that they are trying really hard to make the latest Chrome happen, but it is apparently very hard because of the legacy code and everything, which is understandable, but it's still kind of insane when you think about it. So you're doing SEO, server-side rendering is really important because if you break the JavaScript in Chrome 41 with your ES6 features, you won't get indexed, right? So the SSR is way more important than we were uh, thinking, or at least than I was thinking before. So there you go. Um, uh, no, apparently they don't use the last one. You see, this is the interesting bit. All right, the next thing we got here is the demo for seamless transitions from the awesome Sara Edo. Uh, available in all view next and angular and um, there is demos here that look uh, so it includes the code and it includes the demo let me just show you the demo this looks absolutely slick so if you want to do transition like this there are there is a source code and github linked from that tweet as i said available for view react and angular so you can check it out and uh, make your own pages be just as sick i just thought i would share it because this is absolutely lovely animations okay uh the next tweet we got is is from uh, dr axel rauschmeyer and it talks about the two vet platform features that he's looking forward to and i think those are the features that everyone should be looking forward to because they are kind of awesome First one has been around for quite some time but still is not quite there it is access to the local file system which, you know, once we got that, you would be able to do some crazy things like Photoshop completely in the cloud. Or um, the next feature is something I never heard before about actually it's called executable archives and it allows you to do offline delivery of uh, web apps essentially, which is kind of awesome. So distributing web apps in web package formats, basically this sort of eliminates the need for um, Electron, right? And uh, yeah, it's kind of awesome. Um, all right. Uh, what a roll up. Uh, no, roll up is not exactly for converting ES7 to vanilla. Roll up is just the bundler. Uh, but yes, it does have extensions that allow you to convert ES next, whatever, to the ES5. Okay, the next news is just mind blowing. So it's from Yves van Horn, and I probably pronounced it incorrectly. This is the author or one of the developer, yeah, creator of the Code Sandbox, which is basically my favorite online editor. And um, last time he got VS Code working in the browser and you can actually use the Code Sandbox with VS Code right now. So he just got VS Code extensions working in the browser. So if, if there is an extension in VS Code that doesn't use any bash or whatever, you can now actually run it in the browser. And apparently it just works, which is freaking mind blowing and insane. I, I think at this point, uh, the VS Code team should just hire this guy and make him create the cloud version of VS Code that everyone can use. Even has the Vim working there, which is... <laughs> This is just awesome. Like I just want the VS code to work in my browser so that I can deploy it on my own server and just, you know, write code in the cloud. This would be like a dream. Um, but yeah, this is like, this is amazing. Okay, next thing we got here is Twitter blocking me again. There you go. So the big int proposal has landed in Firefox nightly behind the flag for now, but it is already there, which means it's likely gonna come to the Stable release quite soon, maybe the next two versions. And then uh, we got begins, I believe, almost everywhere, which is kind of great. 
You are worried about Bitcoin miners. What do you mean you're worried about Bitcoin miners? How does VS Code in the cloud relates to the Bitcoin miners? Um, while you're writing this, the next tiny bit we got here is something I did not know about. Apparently ES 2015 actually included binary literals. So you can actually write zero B prefix and then the binary to uh, have binary values in JavaScript, which makes writing some things a lot easier. Like, you know, the whole bit shifting and stuff. Uh, this may be no longer will break my brain when I need to do that because yeah, this is kind of cool. All right, um, is that I think, oh yeah, this is the last one, I think in the tiny bits. Um, not exactly JavaScript, but um, yeah, it's it's basically someone built a JSX for Rust, which looks exactly like JSX and React. And you can write HTML like this with the Rust expressions that do things that looks freaking insane. Look at this. This is literally Java's J6 in, in Rust and it's it's awesome. Uh, hey, Samohavitz, welcome to the stream. Um, yeah, so, you know, if you have any bare interest in Rust, which by the way, compiles to WebAssembly, which means you would be able to compile this to WebAssembly and run it in the browser, it's kind of great. All right, uh, this is it for minor tidbits. Now we got to the releases. There is not that many of them this time around, but there are some interesting ones. So for example, the first one is the React Hot Loader version 4.4.0 beta with the support for the newest uh, React features like forward ref, react.lazy, memo, and a bunch of other minor things. Always nice to see that. Next release we got here is actually the major one, React Beautiful DND version 10.0. If you never tried it, it's a really cool drag and drop components for React uh, by the Atlassian guys. They are, the component is super awesome. If you never tried it, if you ever want to do a drag and drop in React, this is the thing to look at. So the version 10 is 30% faster, has a smarter collision engine. A new feature is combination of items. So you can actually drag items over one another and combine them. And uh, there's the add remove items during the drag support, which was not possible before. And there's a new tree library uh, that they've included there. So again, you know, if you need to do drag and drop in React, this is one of the best libraries that you can actually find there. Version 10 seems to be awesome. Need to upgrade some of my projects to it. Uh, absolutely love it. All right, next thing we got is the uh, VS Code version 1.29. And there's already the fix release out with some minor issues resolution, but uh, this this is October release and introduces a bunch of uh, pretty cool things, including multi-line search, better macOS support, and my favorite one, preview for list all references. So you can actually now see all references of the specific function in your code base found by the VS Code specifically for you, which is a very handy function that I've used quite a lot in other languages and IDEs. So it's really great to see that landed in TypeScript and JavaScript. Okay, next release we got here is Babel.js version 716, which is a minor release that just fixes a bunch of bugs and regressions. So if you're using Babel, be sure to update to it. Same goes for the React 16.6.3 uh, that just includes a bunch of uh, bug fixes. And you know, if you're using Lazy and Suspense specifically, it's highly recommended to update. Uh, same goes for React DOM. And there's also those fixes are merged into React 16.7.0 alpha 2 with hooks. If you're using hooks, be sure to update your next version. Um, yeah, it's, um, you know, bug fixing and chores. All right, the next thing we got here is Node.js version 11.2.0 with the major highlight being new experimental HTTP parser uh, that is called LLHTTP and is now supported. And there's a more info in the pull request if you're interested. In addition, there's a bunch of bug fixes and minor things that are, I mean, not so interesting, I guess, for the majority of people's. So um, yeah, it's um, quite curious to see where the, uh, when, when the next um, V8 is gonna be merged into Node.js because this, it has some pretty neat features if I remember correctly. But yeah, we're getting, we're getting there. Okay, that's it for the releases. Now we're getting to the pretty large demos and libraries section. And the first thing uh, that was just announced on the Chrome Dev Summit is the web.dev website. From Google guys, the same guys who brought you super slow um, Gmail website. This website uh, wants to help you build the future of the web and build it with faster load times, network resilience, safe and secure, 
easily discoverable, installable, and accessible to all. It's especially amusing to see all of that after the Gmail performance article. But um, yeah, so this is actually a pretty cool website, all the jokes aside. This not just tells you what kind of things you should do with your website, but also how you can achieve that. So if you click on each and every of those components, for example, fast load times, it will actually give you tips on how you can achieve that, you know, how you can measure your site performance, how what you can optimize, how you can optimize your JavaScript, web fonts and stuff like this. So if you are interested in making your website better, unlike the guys behind the Gmail, apparently, then uh, do check it out. This seems to be pretty cool. Okay, next thing is another app announced on the Chrome Dev Summit. It's called squish.app and it's a purely web-based image optimization app that is written using WebAssembly and that allows you to optimize the images for web um, with live preview and everything right in your browser without any server side, which is kind of insane. There's a bunch of codecs available and you can resize it and you can reduce the palette and you will get the preview right away. Where's, where's my, like, oh, I guess it's, it takes some time to update the thing. Come on, two colors. I want to see the black and white image, I guess. There you go. And you got the live preview, which is kind of crazy. And all of that works in your browser without any server side and um, it's open source. So you can actually check out the code to see how exactly that works. Um, and next thing we got here is jspaint.app. This is a bit simpler. This is basically paint in the browser. So I showed you Photoshop last time. This time around, I show you paint. You can, can do things and then you can save it as, a, as an image. I, I don't know why you would want to do that, but there you go. If you ever wanted to have a paint in your browser, this is now a thing. I'm not sure if it's open source, to be honest, but it just looks really good. <laughs> Okay, next thing we got here is a really cool project called require browser. It's an easy to use require function for your browser. And it's actually gives you the Node.js require, which is kind of cool. So the way it works is pretty simple. You uh, start a special dev server, and then you include a special require script in your browser. And you can call require remotely, essentially, uh, at least this is what I gathered it, right? So you can actually use the require FS, require S, require buffer and other Node.js modules, which is kind of cool. Um, obviously, they will like some of them will be replaced with the browser shims. Uh, this so like this requires this um, browserify transpiles the stuff, right? So it's a bundler, it will just take your things, resolve the requires, bundle it in one file, and then you go. This is like a straight up require and it allows you, um, it, it has a server that actually does the whole require. So it's actually when you require a fast, it will use a fast remote, which will be on your server, right? So you actually will have access to the server file system. So it runs the server and fa I guess fakes require for you. Um, which is really cool for experiments, but this is not the production thing. I think it's just a really cool experiment essentially. Uh, so, you know, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. But yes, this is not like browser fire require, essentially not like roll up or webpack or anything out of this. This is basically a remote require. Let's put it this way. Okay. Next thing we got here is Chai Limiter. Um, <laughs> this is how I'm going to call it. Uh, it's a uh, light express rate limiting using Redis. So if you ever need to rate limit your uh, connections in express, and you want to do it using Redis for uh, doing yes or exactly. Um, you can do that with uh, this rate limiter and it seems to be, I mean, it seems to be pretty straightforward, right? So you just plug it into Redis, you use it as a middleware and you're basically done. There you go. Nothing super complex here. Next thing we got here is Orbi.js. Orbi is a small 1.4 kilobyte experiment of functional components based on JSX and virtual DOM. Exactly as it says, it's now a library for uh, functional components, purely functional, no classes or anything like this. Uh, also with VDOM and JSX, uh, looks quite nice. I mean, again, you know, there's no comparison or anything like this, but I guess this is just the start of the project. So I'm always curious to see how that compares to React, Preact, and other, you know, hundreds of other libraries that basically provides more or less the same things. So I would be curious to see some sort of comparison and documentation explaining why would I pick Orbi over anything else. But nonetheless, an interesting project, interesting project is what I want to say. 
Okay, next thing we got here is Magic Grid, a simple lightweight JavaScript library for dynamic grid layouts. Uh, there's a GIF here and it looks really cool. Um, not sure about performance, so it seems like all the grid is obviously JavaScript kind of related, so I don't know how that will behave on low power computers or mobile phones, but if you are not targeting those, this seems to be pretty nice. I mean, the animations are also pretty cool and the calculation of the grid seems to be done pretty nicely. So if you're looking for something like this, do check it out. Seems to be quite cool. Next thing we got is retoggle UI controls as React hooks to control your component state from outside. Um, this is a component library inspired by the ideas from Dan Abramov. He was talking about people like, you know, when, when someone's going to finally make a hook that actually returns a component and well, Someone did that, so you can actually get a bunch of components using hooks, which is kind of great. So you can actually get like, you know, logging and knobs and things to control the React uh, components essentially, which, yeah, there you go. There's a debugging, debugging thing. It's pretty neat actually, to be honest, and um, it's all hooks. So yeah, kind of cool. CSS seniors recommend to use flex for grids. Yeah, absolutely. Flexbox is really cool. And uh, you know, even if you don't have to target the older browsers, then CSS grid is even better. But maybe you just need to see you know, old browsers. And then again, Flexbox won't really do you this relayouting. I don't know if you can achieve that with Flexbox. I'm not CSS expert, so maybe you do, but um, yeah. Okay, next demo we get here is TensorSpace, Neural Network 3D Visualization Framework that looks freaking amazing. It allows you to do a 3D visualization of a neural network in real time. This looks absolutely awesome. So you actually can see the tensors and intermediate network layers and how exactly does they recognize the number two and all of that in 3D with the whole um, layout and everything. So if you ever was curious, how does your TensorFlow model works? You can actually, I think it's not only TensorFlow, it also supports like Keras and uh, yes, TensorFlow, Keras and TensorFlow.js. It is mind blowing and really, really awesome. So if you're curious, how does your neural network works? You can now throw it in here and um, see what it does and what exactly the layers look like and what exactly happens inside of it, which is crazy when you think about it. Okay, next demo we got here is Project Wizbug. Um, this is another tool that was announced on the Chrome Dev Summit. It's from the Chrome team from the Chrome Google, Google Chrome Labs. And apparently what they wanted to do is something like Chrome Dev Tools. So we had the Firebug, right? And Firebug changed how we debug things. And they wanna change how we design things. So this extension um, apparently aims to make any web page feel like an artboard that you can edit and change at will. It sounds absolutely awesome and I've seen a lot of people praising it, but I haven't tried it myself. And unfortunately there is no um, demo anywhere inside. There's only the extension either for Chrome or Firefox, which is by the way, really awesome. So if you're curious, do check it out because I've seen a lot of praise online about it. So it seems to be basically allowing you to relay out anything you want and then maybe export that as a new uh, code for your app, which is kind of a great idea to be honest. And Firefox uh, dev tools have been moving towards that direction lately quite a lot. So we're gonna see how that ends up. Okay, next uh, demo we got here is my console, a JavaScript editor for your phone in JavaScript. Uh, literally allows you to write JavaScript and execute it right in place uh, on your phone. I never understood why you would want that. I think it's really painful to write anything longer than a few characters on the phone. Uh, but um, yes, the Chrome view thingy. I mean, you know what? Let's just try it right now. Why not? So I'm gonna just install it and we're gonna give it a shot. Yes. Visibug, there you go. So we got the Visibug thing. We can go on a GitHub and we're gonna do this. There you go. So this is how it looks and you can literally, can I resize it? How does it work? We do this and uh, what is this? I don't know what this do. What is this? Move. Okay, so I can actually move the clear. No, this is all right. <laughs> I guess I need a bit, uh, what does this do? Margin. Oh, there's the tips. Okay, Does, do I use like, oh, I can use arrow keys. What? <laughs> okay, yep, I can um, 
yeah, you can literally visually change things. This is neat, but it breaks everything basically. <laughs> so we just broke GitHub like 25 times. <laughs> this is really awesome. What is this position? I can, can I just drag things around? No. Oh yeah, I can. So I just select the thing and then I can drag around it. This is really awesome. Like this is really, really cool. And it, it actually prevents the clicks, so you can actually reliably drag everything. Yep, this is amazing. Um, this is this project Visbug, and it's really awesome. It, in one click, allows you to change just about everything on a page. You can even edit text. Okay, edit text is not that hard, maybe, but <laughs> what is this? Font styles. How does this work? Uh, font style, please. How do I change it? It doesn't fit into the screen. Yeah, come on. Font color. Like, this is awesome. This is, yeah, for designers, this is gonna be freaking amazing. Can I resize this thing? No, I guess I can't. I have a, I, what is this? Flexbox align. Oh boy, okay. You sh wait, what? You shift? You for real right now? How does this work? Saturation brightness. Uh, I guess this only works for images, right? No, it doesn't. It actually works for everything. Um. Oh. Okay, there is some, you know what? I'm not gonna play with it right now because it seems to be absolutely crazy. <laughs> All right, next thing we got here is Brook, a prototyping system built with web components and Houdini Paint API. Essentially allows you to do a screen markup. Uh, you have a bunch of components like screen comments, uh, stack, uh, text, and then you define the lengths of the words and it just outlines them as if it was the wireframe, which looks actually really cool. So if you were looking for a minimalistic wireframing tool using web components, then this looks really great actually. So do check it out. Next thing we got here is Striker, a mutation testing for JavaScript and friends. So I recently discovered the concept of mutation testing, which is absolutely fascinating. Uh, the idea behind mutation testing is super simple. It basically tests your te uh, the, take your tests and then starts mutating your code, right? So you say you have the function that takes uh, two numbers and adds them together, right? So what the mutation will do, it will first execute the test as is, as in, you know, top two plus two equals four, right? And then it will start mutating the function, say, throwing the error or returning something and then trying to execute the test in see if the test passes. If the mutation, um, if, the, if, if it mutates the function and then test passes, that means the mutant, as in the changed function survives, and this has to be investigated by the developer. So essentially, you know, it breaks tests for you so that you can figure out where is something goes wrong, which is an absolutely fascinating concept. And this is an implementation of the mutation testing for JavaScript, which works with like uh, Jest and Mocha and a bunch of other test runners. So if that sounds interesting, which I think it absolutely does, do check it out. It also is available for C Sharp and Scala uh, in the preview modes. Uh, but yeah, the concept of mutation testing is, it's so simple yet really, really cool. And it seems to be quite smart in actually mutating the function. So there's an example of the is old enough, for example, which checks the age for 18, you know, older than 18. So it's actually not just gonna return random values, but it's actually gonna mutate it to return larger than 18 or smaller than 18 or false or true or then throwing errors. And it is really, really cool idea basically. So. Um, I guess it did exist, probably. I'm guessing it's it's some, you know, really obscure uh, scientific concept that was invented like 20 years ago and only now people discovered it and was like, mutation testing sounds awesome, we should implement it. <laughs> Most of the awesome things we get right now are like this, right? So if you actually look at the scientific papers, they were written like in 80s and 90s and then people just forgot about them. But yeah, there's now Striker for JavaScript, so do check it out. This is absolutely fascinating concept and I'm looking forward to seeing where it will end up. Okay, next uh, library we have here is called Decoders and it's a type safe data validation uh, inspired by Elm decoders to use with Flow or TypeScript. Basically allows you to create those uh, decoders and guards that you can actually 
call upon the functions and you know it will essentially tell you either if the function is broken or the the model data model is broken it will throw and if not it will be okay right so you can just uh, validate your data like this right in place which sometimes might be very useful um but yeah i mean again you know if you're already using typescript and i don't know if you would want that i guess for runtime safety maybe Oh yeah, there you go. Okay, the next uh, thing we got here is Slate, a completely customizable framework for building rich text editors made in React.js. So there's a bunch of those, you know, including Draft.js, ProseMirror, Quill, and others. But um, all of them are actually quite a pain in ass to integrate with React. Like most of them, like Draft and Quill, have their own React, like React Draft and Quill Draft. But they are still not quite as easy to actually use with React. Uh, Slate is built upon React. So it's actually essentially is a React component. And it has a ton of features. And uh, it's great. So if you were looking for the text editor that is works with React and allows you to do things like this, look no further. It is right here and it allows you to do links and allows you to do just about everything you were wanted to do, including RTL plugins, force layouts, very large documents, like really large documents, and it's quite performant actually. History, versions, mentions, tables, code highlighting, and all of that in one nice React component package. So uh, do check Slate out if you ever wanted to do React text input. Okay, next thing we got here is React Konami hook. Yes, a hook for reacting to Konami code. Now you don't actually have to write anything. You can just a uh, React hook and uh, provide a function to it that is going to be triggered when a user enters a Konami code on the page, which is up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, if you never heard about that. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's a silly, tiny thing, which is just um, silly fun with React hooks, but uh, there you go. Okay, next thing we got here is doc tier, doc, doc tire, doc, I'm, I guess doc tire, doc tier, I'm not sure. Lightweight runtime type checking and document generation for JavaScript. Um, it's the idea is that you can basically enforce runtime type checking and then generate documentation from that type checking. So you can create this doc tire guards uh, on something like this, for example, right? And you can specify the bunch of uh, checks that it should do, and you can also specify the Doctor spec that will basically give you the documentation, which you can then render into HTML. Uh, to my taste, it seems a bit cumbersome and it's like stuff like this is quite hard to read, but you know, maybe you like a format like this. So check it out. I personally prefer um, more, how to put it, more traditional means of doing that. And you know, JS docs for documentation. And if you need, Real time type checking, there are better options, I think. But uh, there you go. Maybe you were looking for something like this. Okay, next thing we got here is TNG hooks, a React inspired hooks like use state for standalone functions. So if you don't want to react, you can now actually use hooks uh, just in, in a normal function. There you go. So literally what it does. You, know, you can use use state in a function and it will have state. Done. I <laughs> like we're going to have hooks everywhere, don't we? Okay, next thing we got here, <clears throat> apologies, is TipTap, a rich text editor for Vue.js. So um, exactly what it says, a pretty nice um, editor with, again, you know, it looks a lot like Slate in terms of the features, but for Vue.js. So if you're looking for an editor for Vue, this looks pretty cool. Uh, Express.js, yeah, yeah, sure, Express is nice. Why not? Um, I would use hooks with Express probably, but it's kind of the middleware is kind of Express hooks basically. Okay, continuing, we got router, simple JS router designed to solve one problem outside of any framework like React, Angular, or Vue. So essentially a framework agnostic router that you can use anywhere. Uh, I think there's a bunch of them out there, but uh, yeah, there's just another one. Seems to be decent. Doesn't really have any tests, uh, unfortunately. I think it doesn't have to. No, it actually does have tests. Okay, cool. Take my words back. It does have tests. So test it and uh, tiny. So I guess will be a very good learning material as it is essentially just a 50 lines of code. So pretty cool. Next thing we got here is Janeway, a Node.js console REPL with object inspection and many other features. This is basically, uh, it's been around for a while actually. I've seen it like a couple of years ago, I think at first. 
but I thought I would highlight it because it's really neat. And essentially what it does, it allows you to do things like, you know, it's basically Chrome DevTools, but for Node.js because you can write your commands and you will get a very rich output that you can actually click and inspect and, you know, go into prototype and see things like this. It's pretty great. So if you're using a lot of Node.js REPL, but you wanted it to be more interactive, then you can do this. It's, it's kind of good. Yeah, it even has stuff like Hex Viewer, which is just insane when you think about it. WebStorm is nice, true, but, um, you know, you have to, yeah, I mean, I guess if you attach debugger, you would more or less get the same thing. But then again, you don't always want to create new documents, new folder and everything. And with this, you can just start a REPL and start playing around with the uh, packages. So yeah, just a slightly different use case. Okay, next thing we got here is execa, better child processes. Essentially um, available child process thing with a bit of syntactic sugar, like, you know, you can just await the SD out, which is, I always find it to be a pain in the ass to write it your own on your own. I mean, it doesn't take too much time to do it, but it's like you have to wrap it in promise and they have to do this. And then there's like a bunch of defaults they have to provide. This essentially simplifies all of that uh, for you. So yeah, it's quite a nice module. Next thing we got here is Mongoose PII. Um, I guess you would read it as PII. It's basically a plugin that lets you transparently encrypt stored personal, personally identifiable information and uh, use securely hashed passwords. The idea is that, you know, when you set up any schema that has personal information that you want to have encrypted, you can just register a plugin here and say which fields you want to encrypt with which password and what's the password field. And you're done. It will basically handle all the encryption for you. So if your database gets hacked and leaked, all the user data is actually going to be encrypted, which is kind of handy. So if you care about your user information security, then you can just, you know, use that to encrypt and decrypt it, which seems to be very nice. Okay, next thing we got here is URL lights, or is it your yeah, your lights, uh, very small, fast dependency free URL parser for matter for Node.js and the web. So yeah, exactly. It's just URL parser seems to be I like, I don't know how format, like we already talked about JS parsing, like URL parsing in this podcast at some point. And I don't know how spec compliant this thing is, but if you were looking for a super tiny URL parser, maybe use that, maybe try that. Maybe it does what you want, but just be careful with that. Okay. Okay, next thing we got here is this awesome demo called turtle.audio. It's a music sequencer inspired by turtle graphics programming and runs in the browser and it looks absolutely amazing. And you can do things like this. I won't turn on the sound, but essentially it allows you to draw things and then sequence music using them, which is working great. And there's a lot of really cool examples already in the comments and kids are loving it apparently. And uh, just try it out. It's it's really awesome. Like I've I've played with this thing for a couple of hours when I first discovered it. Really cool. Okay. Next thing we got here is nginxconfig.io, a pretty cool tool that has a preset configs for a bunch of things like front end, back end, Node.js, single page app, WordPress, and Drupal, and then you can configure a bunch of other. Uh, settings using simple checkboxes and you get the finished nginx config as the output which is quite handy and the last thing we got in the demos is called web tty which is a thing that allows you to share a terminal session over web rdc so it's actually a mix of uh i believe it's a javascript typescript which is a bit weird and golang so the server side written on golang and then the client side is just the browser. Essentially, you can um, start a server wherever you want. And then you have this uh, specific code that you have to enter in the client side. And then you can just access your SS, uh, sorry, the terminal session over the WebRTC, which seems to be working quite well. I mean, it's kind of neat. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. This is pretty cool. Okay. That is it for the demos. Now we go to uh, now we come to the interesting and curious things. I have quite a bit of them today. The first one being that HTTP slash three announced, which is actually going to be HTTP over quick, which is actually not no longer is going to be um, over TCP, right? So now right now all the HTTP protocol works over TCP, 
But Quick is a UDP protocol, and um, apparently HTTP 3 is going to be working over UDP, which is quite interesting. So we're going to see how that all ends up. Um, there's been a lot of jokes that, hey, they are now HTTP 3, so now you can start finally looking at HTTP 2, which I think actually quite true. So if you're interested about more details over HTTP 3, do check the article out. It does give you a brief overview of basically what it means and how it will going to work and what's going to happen in the future, which, I mean, it's quite fascinating, to be honest, but uh, yeah. Uh, next article we got here is researchers discover seven new meltdown inspector attacks uh, and all processors are affected, including ARM and AMD. So if you thought that we're done with meltdown inspector, apparently we're not and we're all screwed and there's basically the current CPU architecture is completely broken and we need something new in the next years or we're gonna pay heavily with the performance for mitigating those attacks. Um, the article has a bit bunch more technical details, so if you're curious, do check it out. Next thing we got here is the new inspiring programming languages article on Dev2. The article itself only mentions a couple of languages, but do look in the comments because this is where the cool discussions are happening and there is a list of pretty cool Languages over here, for example, Crystal looks fascinating and uh, Reason also looks quite interesting. Um, so if you're interested in learning new languages and was thinking what to pick up, do check those out. They are quite cool. Okay, the next thread I want to share is called Ask Hacker News. What's the largest amount of bad code you have ever seen work? It is terrifying to read all of that. As you can see here, the thread is large and there are some insane horror stories. There is, um, I think one of my favorite was about the construction worker who was tasked, who was just, you know, the, the, I don't, I'm not sure what was the story in the end, but it was like, they gave him time to code a system in like 10 years ago. And over the 10 years he was coding the system and you can track his evolution as a software developer over the 10 years, you know, from him not knowing anything and just writing spaghetti code to him learning what is object-oriented system programming, what is functional programming. And there is like hundreds over hundreds lines of codes written over 10 years that are absolutely terrible and terrifying. Um, fascinating and terrifying things. So if you're interested in stories like this, do check it out, it is pretty cool. And the last thing I wanna show you, it is actually a website called Shop Safe This Holiday Season. And it's, um, done by Mozilla Foundation and is basically gadgets um, marked by creepiness by Mozilla guys uh, by according to their privacy standards. So you know how much do the gadgets respect your privacy essentially from being not creepy like Nintendo Switch. It is just a tiny bit creepy because you know it has things like the privacy policy is actually a bit garbage and it actually shares your information with third parties for unexpected reasons to being super creepy, like random Chinese things that are, or like, yeah, Amazon Alexa, which is like, there is so many red dots here. So it's like, yeah, um, it's an interesting guide. So if you were curious about the whole, you know, privacy policies and stuff like this, uh, do check it out. Apparently the art, you know, what was the name of it? BB-8 robot is actually a bit creepy because it actually shares, shares information about you. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's just an interesting um, insight into the holiday season and the gifts and how do they relate to privacy. All right, that is actually it from my side, guys. So do you have any questions, suggestions, or any links that I might have missed? If not, we can wrap it up here. As usual, you can find all those links on the GitHub. The link should be in the description to the episode or to the Twitch channel or whatever you're watching this. Uh, as usual, we're more than happy to see you join our Discord server. We do have a lot of things going on there. So, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, doesn't doesn't seem like there's any question. Thank you very much for watching. As always, Bagao, more than happy to see you guys on the stream. Uh, I can check Terraform IO. What is this? Terraform, write, plan, create infrastructure as code. Uh, that doesn't tell me anything. Uh, what is it? What is it? What, 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 is something blocked? Because resource, DigitalOcean, Droplet, resource. Uh, so what does this do? Docs. 
Okay, you know what? I'm gonna check that this seems to be complex. Like those deployment platforms are usually complex as hell, but I definitely will check this out. Let me just move it over here. This does seems to be cure. I think I've heard about it some time ago. Auto infrastructure, huh, that is curious. Okay, thank you for sharing. I will definitely check this out. This seems interesting. Okay, um, right. Doesn't seem like there's any more um, links or questions or anything. So once again, feel free to join our Discord server. Thank you for watching. Have an awesome weekend or awesome rest of the week or you know whatever you're watching this. And I see you next time. Bye.